the number one long form writer that helps SEOs outrank competition at the click of a button using real time research and NLP. Start ranking content today with content at scale.ai. Wit Studio, one end to end web creation platform for your agency to deliver exceptional work with absolute efficiency. Okay. <laughs> so the last time that I spoke at Brighton SEO, a phone went off and it was a really, really good 80s ringtone. So if your phone is silent and this is you, please just feel free to turn it right on up. Um, it might provide some comic relief at the right point in my talk. If not, well, all phones should be silent. And thanks for coming to my talk, which is on how to use psychology to better manage your team and clients. My name is Kara Thurkettle, and I'm an SEO manager at an e-commerce SEO and performance PR agency called Novos. I've got over 100 slides to get to today, so if you want to know more, chat with me afterwards or connect with me on LinkedIn. All right, why are we all here? First, some of you want to ensure you retain your employees because the churn is real. Second, recruiters are taking all of your money, and you also want to mitigate the potential loss of clients caused by employee churn. Third, you recognize that you could do better. Or fourth, you, want to become, you don't want to become the managers that you've had. Whatever the reason, you're here and I'm here to help. So what is our agenda for today? First, we'll define organizational psychology. Then we'll dive into organizational commitment and why it's important. From this, we'll look into what drives human behavior and influences our level of commitment. Then we'll dive into the core areas that industrial organizational psychologists look at to address organizational commitment. After this, we'll examine a toolbox that you can use to address common issues in the workplace. And finally, we'll cover a few tips on how you can use what you've learned so far to improve your client management skills. So what is industrial organizational psychology? Well, it's defined as the scientific study of human behavior in the workplace, and it's centered around four key pillars. First, we're different individuals. Organizational psychologists recognize uh, this diversity and tailor management strategies, work designs, and interventions to accommodate individual differences, such as personality, skills, preferences, and backgrounds. This is because a one-size-fits-all approach is not seen as effective. Second, our behaviors are caused meaning we should dig into the why behind employee behavior. Organizational psychologists look at the deeper reasons behind employee behavior, considering psychology, social factors, as well as the work environment. By figuring out these um, causes, psychologists can find ways to motivate employees, boost performance, and make the workplace better. Third, we are whole people. Organizational psychologists value the multifaceted nature of individuals focusing on their phys physical, cognitive, emotional, and social aspects. The, this whole person principle stresses considering all aspects of an individual's well-being, not just work-related factors. This holistic approach, which includes health, relationships, and personal growth, um, can boost job satisfaction, engagement, and overall life satisfaction. Fourth, we deserve dignity. Human dignity means treating individuals with respect, fairness, and empathy. Organizational psychologists promote ethical and humane treatment of employees, foster, uh, fostering inclusivity and transparency. This creates a positive workplace culture, enhancing morale, cooperation, and commitment. And psychologists use these pillars to help businesses improve organizational commitment in their companies. But what is organizational commitment and why does it matter? Organizational commitment refers to an employee's loyalty, attachment, and dedication to the company that they work for. It has three types. Type one is effective commitment, which is emotional attachment to an organization. Type two is continuous commi continuance commitment, which is based on the cost of leaving, like loss in salary, etc. And type three is normative commitment, which arises from a moral duty to stay due to gratitude, organizational investment, and reciprocity. And these are important because employees who lack organizational commitment of any kind will leave. People quit for a variety of reasons, and so we as managers need to make sure we're doing everything we can to keep our employees committed to working with us. But what drives our behavior and influences our level of commitment? According to research by famous behavioral psychologists, including B.F. Skinner, Ivan Pavlov, Victor Schwab, Robert Cialdini, and more, people are influenced and driven by uh, contingencies and emotions. But what does this mean, really? Well, first, behavioral contingencies are situations that result from your actions. They link to reinforcement. So doing something either gets you a reward, which is positive reinforcement, or stops something bad, which is negative reinforcement. 
For instance, at Novos, if we complete our goals for the quarter, we get a bonus, which reinforces this behavior. Second, emotional drivers are feelings that affect our actions, whether good or bad. For example, a positive emotion, such as the joy of helping a client succeed, can boost our effort. Conversely, a negative emotion, such as the fear of missing a deadline, can drive us to work harder. Emotions greatly impact how we work. You want people to feel positively reinforced to be at your company or feel rewarded. You also want them to feel emotionally invested to be at your company and associate you with positive emotions. This is how you achieve organizational commitment. So what are some of the core problem areas psychologists look at to address organizational commitment? First is employee motivation, which is the intricate mix of internal and external factors that energize us in the workplace to start and maintain our efforts toward organizational goals. It shapes our dedication, enthusiasm, and effectiveness in performing our job and varies among individuals. Second is job satisfaction, which is how content and happy we feel about our work, company, and working conditions. And finally, our leadership and company culture. Leadership guides and inspires while company culture reflects, a shared, um, reflects shared values and behaviors. Effective leadership shapes, shapes a positive culture, um, influencing teamwork and company successes. So how can you address issues impacting these in simple yet psychologist-backed ways? So we're going to look at what are the psych frameworks for each area? What are the key pillars for each area? How are you fucking it up? And how can you get it right? So, how can you address motivation issues? First, let's look at some of the psychological frameworks that explain how motivation is influenced in the workplace. First is self-determination theory, which says that people are happier at work when they feel motivated from within and when their jobs let them feel in control, competent, and connected to others. Next is Locke and Latham's goal setting theory, which says that having clear, challenging goals and feedback at work can boost motivation. When people know what they're aiming for, they work harder and they perform better. And last is Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which is a psychological theory that arranges human needs into a pyramid. It suggests that people prior prioritize fulfilling lower level needs like food and safety before higher level needs such as love, self-esteem, and self-actualization. Based on these, motivation is based on five key pillars. First is autonomy, which is the level of independence and control an individual has over their work. When we're empowered to make decisions, have a say in how we approach our tasks, and are given the freedom to take ownership of our work, it can significantly enhance our motivation and job satisfaction. Second is mastery, which involves the opportunity for employees to continuously develop and improve their skills and expertise. When we're provided with opportunities for growth, learning, and skill enhancement, we experience a sense of accomplishment and increased motivation to excel in our roles. Third is purpose, which is the understanding of how one's work contributes to a larger mission and meaningful goal. When we can see the direct impact of our efforts and understand how our work aligns with the organization's overall objectives, we are more likely to feel a strong sense of purpose as well as motivation. Fourth is recognition, which involves acknowledging and appreciating employees' contributions and achievements. Regularly recognizing and rewarding us for our hard work and accomplishments can significantly boost uh, motivation as it validates our efforts and creates a positive work environment. Fifth is connection. Uh, which refers to the relationships and sense of belonging within a team or organization. When we feel valued, supported, and connected to our colleagues and leaders, it enhances our motivation. A positive social environment fosters collaboration, communication, and a shared commitment to achieving, achieving common goals. So how are you destroying motivation in your team? First, you're assuming what motivates you motivates your team. Everyone has unique goals, uh, values, and drivers, and neglecting these differences can lead to disengagement. Second, you're micromanaging your team, which undermines autonomy. Third, you're not offering skill development, learning, and career advancement opportunities in dampening your team's sense of mastery. Fourth, you're not effectively communicating how your team's work contributes to the organization's larger goals, leaving them feeling purposeless. And fifth, you're undermining motivation when you don't consistently acknowledge and appreciate your team's efforts and achievements. When your team's hard work isn't recognized or valued, it can make them feel unappreciated and reduce their motivation to excel. And sixth, you're affecting motivation when you don't build a sense of connection and belonging in your team. When communication is lacking, support is missing, and team members feel isolated, it can lead to a disengaged and demotivated workforce. So how can you improve motivation in your team? First, you want to use motivational maps uh, developed by James Sale to identify key factors that motivate employees within your company. Motivational maps will analyze their individual needs, preferences, and intrinsic, intrinsic motivators to help you design strategies that enhance their motivation. 
It does this by telling you which team members are motivated by achievement, relationships, and growth. Each individual typically has a unique blend of these motivators, but one or two usually dominate and have the most significant influence on their behavior and job satisfaction. Next, you want to utilize behavioral nudges specific to the main types of motivators within your company to encourage positive behaviors and motivation. Nudges are subtle cues, reminders, and incentives to nudge employees toward behaviors that influence a positive uh, company culture. To nudge those who are motivated by relationships, you want to foster teamwork, create social events, and encourage mentorship at your company. To nudge those who are motivated by achievement, you want to make sure you're setting them clear and challenging goals, recognizing them both privately as well as publicly, and also providing opportunities for skill and career development. To nudge those who are motivated by growth, you want to make sure you're, you're helping them create training plans, offering CSR opportunities or ways for, that, uh, for them to feel purposeful and meaning, and also ensure you're giving them autonomy and challenges to solve as they love innovation. Finally, uh, you should get your team to fill out the Wheel of Life, which is an assessment that doesn't just look at work, but all aspects of your life to review and balance and help set goals and action plans to improve scores. All right, now that we have tackled motivation, what about job satisfaction? Again, let's have a look at the frameworks. First is uh, there's discrepancy theory, which essentially compares what you put into your job, like effort and time, with what you get out of it, like pain recognition, compared to what others in similar jobs get. If you feel you're getting less than you should compared to your peers, it can make you unhappy at work. Next is two-factor theory, which uh, states that there are two sets of factors that influence job satisfaction and dissatisfaction. Motivator factors, such as achievement, recognition, and responsibility, contribute to job satisfaction, while hygiene factors like salary, working conditions, and job security can lead to dissatisfaction if inadequate. And last is the jobs demands resources model, which emphasizes the balance between job demands and job resources. When job resources like support, social support and opportunities for skill development outweigh the demands such as workload and stress, it can lead to higher job satisfaction. Based on these, job satisfaction is centered on three key pillars. Firstly, the work environment is vital as it affects our overall well-being and job satisfaction. A positive work environment includes safety, comfort, supportive colleagues, work-life balance, and social opportunities. Secondly, roles and responsibilities are crucial as engaging, meaningful work that matches our personality, skills, and interests boosts job satisfaction. Variety, skill development, and task completion also contribute to this. And thirdly, career growth matters. Opportunities for advancement, skill development, and challenge, as well as clear career paths and access to training massively boost our job satisfaction. So why are your employees not satisfied with their job? First, you're allowing a toxic work environment, such as incurring behavior, encouraging behaviors that lead to burnout and allowing bullying or discrimination. Second, you're consistently assigning monotonous, repetitive, or mundane tasks without offering skill development or challenging projects. Third, you're not providing clear pathways for career development and growth. Employees can feel stagnant and unfulfilled in their roles when they perceive there are no opportunities for advancement or skill enhancement within your organization. So how can you boost job satisfaction at your company? First, you want to be wary of the will and skill at your company. This skill will, also known as the Can-Will Matrix, is a tool often used in leadership and management to categorize team members based on their willingness and ability to perform tasks or take on spe specific responsibilities. The reason this is important is because employees who consistently adopt a can't or won't attitude can have a detrimental impact on workplace productivity, morale, teamwork, and innovation. And can and won't employees are at risk of leaving or impacting client churn and relationships if they aren't invested in their work. You want to move these employees into a different role as soon as possible or motivate them in their existing role as soon as possible. Next, you want to utilize Insights Discovery Profiles, which draw from the psychology of Carl Jung to better understand your team's personality traits and tendencies. These profiles help uh, individuals and teams understand themselves and others better by categorizing personality traits into four color energies. Insights Discovery Profiles can be useful in a number of ways. They help people know their strengths so they can do jobs that fit them better. When work matches their natural style, they're happier and more effective. And when we acknowledge and respect our co colleagues' color energies, team communication improves. Diverse teams with balanced color energies work together well, leading to less conflict um, and higher job satisfaction. So by completing motivational maps and insights discovery profiles, you gain additional information that allows you to tailor job progression and tasks to employees' strengths and preferences. This alignment with personality, skills, and interests boosts job satisfaction. In a study of over 7,000 adults, employees were more engaged when their managers focused on their strengths. So what does this look like? 
Employees exhibiting a cool blue energy thrive in analysis and attention to detail. To maximize their potential, assign tasks and enable them to delve into data to enhance and streamline systems. Employees with an earth green energy excel in empathy and relationship building. Encourage their strengths by assigning tasks that foster and strengthen interpersonal connections. Employees radiating sunshine yellow energy thrive on creativity and express expression. Enhance their performance by assigning tasks that unleash their creative potential and encourage networking with peers. Employees with fiery red energy possess strong assertiveness and a focus on results. To leverage their potential, assign challenging tasks that empower them to take the lead and excel. Finally, let's dive into leadership and company culture, nearly there. Again, what are the frameworks? First is culture fit theory, which suggests that employees are more likely to be successful and satisfied in an organization when their values, beliefs, work style, and behavior align with the culture of that organization. In essence, it's the idea that employees should fit in with the prevailing culture of the organization. Next is cultural competence theory, which is a framework used in the workplace to promote understanding, respect, and effective communication among individuals from diverse cultural backgrounds. And it emphasizes the importance of recognizing and valuing cultural differences to create an inclusive and harmonious work environment. Next is cognitive dissonance theory, which suggests that people experience discomfort when they hold conflicting beliefs or attitudes. When change is introduced, it can create cognitive dissonance if employees believe that the new way of doing things contradicts their existing values or attitudes leading to resistance. And finally, social exchange theory which emphasizes the idea that individuals engage in relationships and interactions that are based on the expectation of receiving benefits or reward in return for their contributions. Based on this, leadership and company culture are centered around five key pillars. First, values and beliefs are at the heart of a company culture. When they align with our views, it creates a positive culture that impacts decision making and interactions. Second, in the workplace, diversity encompasses differences among people such as race, gender, and background. Inclusion is the practice of creating a welcoming environment where we all feel valued and have equal opportunities to succeed. Together, they promote equity and enrich workplaces. Third, high-quality leader member exchanges mean there is mutual trust, respect, and support, which can lead to increased job satisfaction and performance. Fourth, the employee-employer relationship means employees may invest time, effort, and skills into their work in exchange for various rewards, such as salary, job security, opportunities for advancement, and recognition. Employers, in turn, expect us to contribute to the success of the organization by fulfilling our roles successfully. And last is change management, which is the systemic process of planning, implementing, and guiding organizational changes to achieve successful outcomes while minimizing resistance and disruptions. So how are you messing it all up? First, your feedback systems are broken and not effective with outdated methods like the feedback sandwich method. Second, your company isn't accommodating or built for diverse employees to be successful. Third, you're not training your leaders how to manage or lead or you're not seeking it as a manager. And fourth, you're just changing things without a plan or consulting your team. So how can you prove your leadership and culture? First, start by conducting 360 and engagement surveys to gain insights into individual and team performance to help boost morale and retain top talent. These surveys promote open communication, facilitate skill enhancement, and drive organizational change, reducing cognitive dissonance within the company. One thing to be mindful of, though, is that in order for 360 feedback surveys to work, the people receiving the feedback need to be able to understand it and action it. As an autistic person, the main issue I've had with feedback given to me over the years is that it's often given very broadly and doesn't give me specific examples of issues and how I can improve those specific issues specifically. Aside from surveys, you should establish the Diverse People Committee to represent the company, allowing employees to raise concerns and feel valued. At Novos, our committee drove positive change in remote work and paternity leave policies, among others. Third, ensure your leaders are trained before promotion with programs integrating psychological insights to enhance skills like emotional intelligence, communication, and conflict resolution. Consider Clifton's strengths profiles for managerial assessments to identify strengths and areas for improvement. Lastly, a structured change process, such as Lewin's change management model, is, a, is in place when implementing company changes. This model prioritizes listening to employee concerns, supporting leaders in rollout, and allowing the team time to adapt to the change before making more. So to wrap this up, how can you use what you've learned so far to improve your client management skills? First, you should assign team members to clients who work in the way they do and communicate in the way they do to create synergy. When uh, we want people to be accommodating to our needs, we also need to be accommodating to the needs of clients. 
Second, you should make sure that your client's values are aligned with your own. Several members of our team care about ethically responsible sourcing of products and treatment of staff, as well as sustainability, and we make it a point to partner with businesses who share these values. And lastly, you should consider how you roll out changes and communicate these with clients. Like employees, clients are also subject to cognitive dissonance, and you want to make sure they understand the what, why, and how of the change and be able to voice their concerns. I had about 500 more slides with tips, but unfortunately, Brighton SEO only gave me 20 minutes. So if you want to know more, I'll be putting out more mini pieces of training over the next few months, so watch this space. I have added one additional bonus slide to my upload p uploaded PDF in the client section, and thank you for listening. Monthly reporting making you want to shove sharp things up your nose? Try Dragon Metrics, the all-in-one SEO software with mind-blowing reporting tools. 